Welcome to Monday Matinee on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. there and welcome to episode 588 of the Sonic Society, the world's weekly showcase of modern audio theater. I'm Jack Ward, and just like the famous Grover's book, there's a monster at the end of this podcast. And I'm David Alt. I- oh, I'm not the monster, am I? But um, Jack, you-, you don't mean an actual, actual monster. No, you're too delightful to be a monster. Although oh, you do play Jack. one in some shows. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> <laughs> You'll just have to wait until we get there, though, David. In the meantime, we're treated tonight with two shows, Imposters by Jeff and Emily Best and Greenhorn Tales from J.D. Sutter. And it all begins right here. Where's the beginning of the end? <laughs> dum, dum, dum. <laughs> on the Sonic Society. The hyacinth has a very military bearing, does it not? How remiss of me to have forgotten my bicycle clips. The gazelle will avert its gaze from the mulberry bush when the cuckoo has returned its library books to Murmansk. The short trousers in the undergrowth belong to the Norwegian. The bald-headed eagle has much to answer for. The swallow has returned to Capistrano. The Scheidhawk still resides in Cairo, but hears only the sound of the trumpet. The one-eyed partridge of recent acquaintance remains partial to the sausage. The dolphin and the porcupine have been strangely neglected of late. The aubergine and the archbishop have gone shopping. Mrs. Abercrombie has a fine pair of tits, but the platypus remains in great indignation. Do you have it? Do I have what? The material. What material? Oh, didn't they tell you? Of course they told me. Well? I wasn't born yesterday. I can see that. Do you have it? Do I have what? The device. What device? Were you briefed? Of course I was briefed. Well? I didn't just get off the last bus. Are you a homosexual? Not necessarily. Are you? Not necessarily. It always pays to be careful. I couldn't agree more. So, do you have the material or not? In what sense do you mean have? In the sense of possession. In the sense of possession with immediate access, or not? The more immediate, the better. In the sense of about my person? Either about your person or not. Well, that depends. On what? On whether you have the device or not. In the sense of possession with comparable access? Preferably. If I confirmed I had the device, would you confirm you had the material? Well, that depends. On what? On who wanted the material. Suppose I wanted it. When? Now. Now might be difficult. Why? I might not have it now. Suppose you did have it now. I didn't say I haven't got it now. So, you do have it now? I said I might not have it now. Would you have it later? Uh, Later would be a possibility. How much later? Uh, That depends. On what? On whether you have the device or not. I might have it. Now or later? Either now or later. Well, anyone could say they might have it now or later... Suppose I said, I do have it. Well, anyone could say, they do have it. And even if you did have it, how would I know whether what you said you have is genuine? 
You just have to take my word for it. <laughs> Fat chance. It's the same as I'd have to take your word for it. But even if I did, you're not likely to have the genuine device if you're not who you're supposed to be. Didn't they tell you who I am? Of course they told me. Well, that's who I am. Not necessarily. Who else would I be? An imposter. That's ridiculous. Is it? Who would I be imposting? Who you're supposed to be. Why would I impost who I'm supposed to be if I'm already who I'm supposed to be? Oh, imposters never impost who they're not supposed to be. How do I know you're not an imposter? If I were an imposter, not only might I be more likely to not have the material, but I might not be here. Why not? Because whether I had the material or not, I might not know where here is. Suppose you were an imposter. And you did have the material, and you did know where he is. Go on. But you didn't know whether what you had was the genuine material or not. Go on. You could be playing for time until I confirmed it was the genuine material. Or until you confirmed it wasn't. Why would I confirm it wasn't? Because you might not have the genuine device. Why would I confirm it wasn't, even if I didn't have the genuine device? If you did suspect I was an imposter... You might also suspect that I didn't have the genuine material, and you'd be giving the game away by confirming it wasn't, if it was. But if you were an imposter, you wouldn't know the genuine material if it jumped up and bit you on the arse. Unless I were an imposter who did happen to know the genuine material, whether it jumped up and bit me on the ass or not. What if I confirmed it was? If it wasn't. Well, that would depend on whether you confirmed it was because you knew it wasn't, or whether you confirmed it was because you didn't know whether it was or it wasn't. Suppose I didn't know. Go on. Suppose you were an imposter who didn't have the genuine material. Go on. Suppose you were here hoping to get it from me. Yeah, but, but even if you had it, and you wouldn't, I'd want the genuine device, not the genuine material. You wouldn't know that if you were an imposter. How would either of us know whether or not we were both imposters, neither of whom had the genuine material nor the genuine device? Unless, of course, at least one of us isn't. If I'm an imposter, how did I know the passwords? You didn't. You read them out of the stolen notebook. What stolen notebook? The stolen notebook you put back in your pocket. Even if the notebook was stolen, and I'm not saying it was, and... Even if I did read out the passwords from it, that wouldn't necessarily indicate that I am an imposter. Well, what else would it indicate? It might indicate a short-term, non-retentive memory. It might indicate an imposter with a short-term, non-retentive memory. If I were an imposter with a short-term, non-retentive memory, how would I have remembered where I put the stolen notebook if it was stolen, what was in it, and what I was supposed to do with what was in it, assuming I happened to remember I had it in the first place? Drugs. Drugs? You could have injected yourself with long-term retentive memory-inducing drugs. Not if I had an allergy. To what? Needles. Would you have an allergy if you weren't an imposter with a short-term non-retentive memory? I don't see why not. Would you have an allergy if you were an imposter who just happened to not have a short-term non-retentive memory? To needles? Well, all sorts of things. I don't see why not. Imposters don't have allergies to all sorts of things. If I am an imposter, and I'm not saying I am, and if the notebook was stolen, and I'm not saying it was, how did the stolen notebook come into my possession? You stole it from who you're supposed to be. But even if I did steal it from who I'm supposed to be, and I'm not saying I did, that would only have given me the passwords. How would I know about the material, or the device, or the time, or the place? You could have tortured who you're supposed to be until he spilled the beans. What? With my allergies? Are you telling me that imposters are allergic to inflicting torture? Yes, if they're allergic to all sorts of things. That's ridiculous. Even if I wasn't an imposter, allergic to all sorts of things, and I'm not saying I'm not... And even if I did torture who I'm supposed to be until he spilled the beans, and I'm not saying I didn't, I wouldn't have remembered it, would I? Not with my short-term, non-retentive memory. Unless, of course, you didn't have a short-term, non-retentive memory. It didn't escape my notice that you also read out the passwords from your stolen notebook, yet you haven't denied stealing it from whom you're supposed to be, and torturing him. 
until he spilled the beans. Why would I go to all that trouble if I knew that an imposter with allergies to all sorts of things and with a short-term non-retentive memory would be unlikely to have the genuine device? You wouldn't necessarily know that. It would be a reasonable inference. From what? From what you've already said. You can't infer something from what somebody already says before they've said it. Have you already said you do have it? I haven't already said that I don't have it. That's neither here nor there. I suppose both of us were actually imposters. Go on. I suppose who we're both supposed to be had already been tortured by two other imposters who stole the original notebooks with the right passwords in and planted false notebooks with the wrong passwords in before we got there. Do they have any allergies or short-term non-retentive memories? Not necessarily. Go on. Neither of us would know whether we were using the incorrect passwords or not. And neither of us would be here with either the genuine material or the genuine device. That's unlikely, because if both of who we're both supposed to be had already spilled the beans about coming here with the material and the device to the two other imposters before we got there, the false notebooks would only have the wrong passwords in and nothing else. Suppose the two other imposters copied the spilled beans about coming here with the material and the device into the false notebooks with the wrong passwords in. That's ridiculous. Why? Because if they had, not only would they both be here with the stolen genuine material and the stolen genuine device, but we would also be here having discovered the time and place from the false notebooks with neither the genuine material nor the genuine device and... With the wrong passwords. That's a very glib hypothesis. Unless, of course, the two other imposters planted counterfeit material and a counterfeit device on whoever they're supposed to be and also planted a fictional time and place in the false notebooks. With the wrong passwords? Of course. Why would they have done that? So as to not arouse suspicion. Well, whose suspicion would be aroused? Ours. Only if one of us is an imposter. Why? Well, suppose there were two other imposters who got there first, but only one of us is also an imposter. Go on. Well, that would mean that the other one of us wasn't. Go on. In which case, one of those the other two imposters are imposting is also an imposter. That would mean that one of us wasn't there. Precisely. Well, I wasn't there. But I've only got your word for that. If only one of us is an imposter and used the wrong passwords, why didn't the other one say anything? Would you have said anything? That depends. On what? On whether you had the map. What map? Well, if you weren't an imposter, you'd know about the map. I'm not saying I don't know about the map. All right. Where is it a map of? And don't say Bogner. I wasn't going to say Bogner. Why not? Anyone could say Bogner. Anyone could say Ipswich. Why would I have a map of Ipswich? I'm not saying you would have a map of Ipswich. Ipswich is nowhere near Bogner. That depends. On what? On whether the map is genuine or not. If there is a map. Of Bogner or Ipswich? Look, knowing about the map is one thing. Actually having the map is quite another. <laughs> Anyone could say they had the map. If there is a map. You could have stolen it. So could you. Yeah, I could have. But I'm not supposed to have it. If there is one. How would I know that if I were an imposter? You wouldn't, which is why I'm being cautious. What would you say if I said I did have the map? The genuine map you stole or the counterfeit map you made up? Either. That would depend. On what? On whether you knew the secret hand signal. What secret hand signal? If you weren't an imposter, You'd know that whenever a map is involved, there's always a secret hand signal. Only if the map is genuine. Of course. And if I weren't an imposter but you were, it would be foolhardy of me to acknowledge it, if it were true. And I'm not saying it isn't. All right. Let's assume that either there is a genuine map and a secret hand signal, or there isn't. Go on. And let's assume you're not an imposter with a short-term non-retentive memory and allergies to all sorts of things. Go on. It's perfectly feasible that when you tortured who you're supposed to be, he not only spilled the beans, but also demonstrated the secret hand signal. What about the two other imposters? Oh, forget about them. Well, that's easy for you to see. 
<laughs> All right. Suppose, for the sake of argument, they were late and you got there first. Both of them? No, no, just your one. Why was he late? Because of the traffic. So I wouldn't have known how late he was going to be. No. If I didn't know how late he was going to be, I wouldn't have known how long I had to do the business. All right. Suppose he arrived late, but at the wrong place. Where? It doesn't matter where. Well, how do you know it was a he? It could have been a she. All right. Suppose your one was a she. Would she have been wearing heavy makeup? Possibly. She might have been late because she spent too much time putting her makeup on. If she wore any at all. But that still doesn't explain why she would have gone to the wrong place. There could be any number of reasons for that. Have you considered that she might have been a he wearing heavy makeup? Of course I have. Or a she with short back and sides? Look, if they went to the wrong place, it wouldn't matter, would it? Unless they did go to the right place late enough for me to do the business, but early enough to bump into me as I was leaving. But would that matter if you'd already done the business? It would if they could go back in time and get there before I did. Go back in time? Suppose they were an alien from a planet in another galaxy, thousands of light years away. Did you see the spaceship? I might have. Well, did you or didn't you? I said I might have because it might have been disguised as a bus. A bus? That's ridiculous. What number? It could have been any one of several numbers. If aliens can take on human form, then surely their spaceships could be disguised as any bus number they wanted. But if aliens can take on human form and disguise their spaceships as buses, how could I be sure that you're not an alien? Because I didn't come by bus. What sort of proof is that? Did you come by bus? Oh, now you're being ridiculous. No, I'm not. Did you steal the map or not? If there is one. Well, suppose I did steal the map, and I'm not saying I did. What if whom I'm supposed to be couldn't demonstrate the secret hand signal? If there is one. If there is one. Why not? Because I might have tied him up. How did you tie him up? I can't tell you how. I could be compromised. He could have wriggled out of it? He didn't. I've only got your word for that. Suppose we were both impostors who tied up who were both supposed to be so that neither of them could demonstrate the secret hand signal. If there is one. Go on. We could have made up our own secret hand signals, but neither of us would know they weren't the correct secret hand signals. Unless we both knew we were both impostors. Or unless we only both suspected we were both impostors. Or unless neither of us were impostors and both knew there wasn't a secret hand signal. Or unless neither of us were impostors and both made up our own secret hand signals and then pretended to recognize them as a double bluff. Suppose I'm not an imposter, and there is a secret hand signal. Go on. Suppose I demonstrate it. Go on. Suppose you say it's incorrect. Go on. Suppose I've deliberately demonstrated the incorrect secret hand signal. Why would you do that? Because I've been trained to not divulge the correct secret hand signal to an imposter under any circumstances. Well, that goes without saying. In which case, in an attempt to convince me that you're not an imposter, you'll say that's incorrect, whether it is or it isn't. No, I wouldn't. Yes, you would? Go on, then. Ready? Yes. Well, that's incorrect. I didn't say it wasn't incorrect. I might have said that's incorrect deliberately. Why would you say you said it deliberately if you were going to say it anyway? Because an imposter would have expected me to not say it deliberately. And if you were who you're supposed to be, you would have been trained to expect the unexpected. If I were an imposter, how would I know you knew I dropped a bollock? If I did drop a bollock. You wouldn't. Because I know from my training and experience that anyone could drop a bollock, whether they're an imposter or not. And dropping a single bollock is not necessarily incriminating. Suppose I am actually who I'm supposed to be, and you're actually who you're supposed to be, and suppose I do actually have the genuine material, and you actually have the genuine device. Go on. If it's not necessarily incriminating, am I to infer that you would have no qualms about dropping a single bollock? Not necessarily, if there is one to be dropped, and I'm not saying there is. In which case, you would have no qualms about demonstrating the funny walk. What? 
funny walk? If there is one. I'm not saying there isn't a funny walk, but if there is one, I might have decided to not mention it deliberately, as an extra precaution. And since you haven't mentioned it deliberately, how would I know whether you haven't because there isn't one, or whether you haven't because you don't know if the funny walk is a red herring or not? Knowing there is a funny walk or not is one thing, and demonstrating the funny walk is quite another. So you would have no qualms about dropping a single bollock if you were to demonstrate it? Probably not. Go on, then. There'd be no point, would there? Why not? Because if you said it was the incorrect funny walk, you wouldn't know whether I dropped a bollock deliberately or not. Unless it wasn't the incorrect funny walk, but I said it was. After all, impostors have been known to spy on training sessions. Everybody knows that training sessions always include not only how to do it correctly, but how to do it incorrectly as a precaution, thereby making it difficult for any impostor who had spied on training sessions to replicate the correct one. What if the impostor were hiding behind a big tree, had very powerful binoculars and could lip-read? Everybody knows that training sessions are conducted in a highly evolved language, which eliminates all lip movement. Suppose you were an imposter, who'd heard there was a funny walk, but couldn't demonstrate it, because who you're supposed to be couldn't demonstrate it. Because he was tied up? No. Did I torture him until he spilled the beans? Yes. So, why couldn't he demonstrate the funny walk? Because you chopped his legs off. Why would I do that? It's what imposters always do. Is that what you would have done? Of course I would. Even though you knew an imposter could afford to drop a single bollock and make up a funny walk? Unless I knew they would drop a single bollock by making up the secret hand signal. If they made up the funny walk as well, they would have dropped a second bollock, which would be a dead giveaway. Do you mean that if I offered to demonstrate the correct secret hand signal, if there is one, you wouldn't offer to demonstrate the funny walk, if there is one, because... You would have to drop a second bollock by making it up? That would depend on whether your secret hand signal is correct or not. Although, I wouldn't, of course, say one way or the other. All right. Ready? Yes. Wrong hand. Wrong hand? What would you say if I said I knew that who you're supposed to be is left-handed? I'd say several things. Firstly, that's ridiculous. Secondly, I am who I'm supposed to be and I'm not left-handed. Thirdly, even if I wasn't who I'm supposed to be, how would you know whether he's left-handed or not? Fourthly, you did yours with your right hand and I never said a word about it. Fifthly, I might have done it with my right hand deliberately. You might have dropped a bollock. An imposter would not know a dropped bollock from a wet fart. Even an imposter would know his right from his left. I might be ambidextrous. I might be a hamster. Suppose I am an imposter, and I'm not saying I am. And suppose who I'm supposed to be is normally left-handed, but had very recently broken it and could only demonstrate the secret hand signal with his right hand. Was it a bad break? Quite a bad break. Did you break it? No. It was broken before I got there. Before he wrote down the correct passwords in the notebook you stole? Possibly. Are you asking me to believe he wrote down the correct passwords with his right hand when he was left-handed? He might have written them down very slowly. That would have made him late. Not if he'd started writing them down very slowly, much earlier than usual. That seems a bit far-fetched. He might have dictated them. To a third party? Possibly. Is it any wonder we exercise extreme caution? Suppose he had a gun, and I'm not saying he did. Go on. Well, suppose he was right-handed, and I'm not saying he was. Go on. He might have used his left hand for the secret hand signal, leaving his right hand free to shoot someone in the event of something kicking off. I thought it was broken. Suppose it was only badly bruised. Did he have it x-rayed? He didn't say. Well, there you are, then. Are you suggesting he was trying it on? Can you think of any other explanation? It would be unwise to assume there isn't one. Did you untie him first? He might have demonstrated the secret hand signal with his left hand before I tied him up. Why would he do that if he had a gun? Why didn't he just shoot you with it? With his badly bruised right hand. If it was badly bruised. Suppose he attempted to shoot me, whether his right hand was badly bruised or not. Go on. Suppose I'm highly trained in oriental martial arts. Well, that goes without saying. 
Well, suppose I happen to be a particularly lethal exponent of certain moves. What certain moves? Well, certain moves known only to the initiated. Well, show me one. Well? Well, what? Did you see it? See what? A certain move so swift as to be indiscernible to the naked eye when executed by an exponent in peak condition. So indiscernible to the naked eye that the exponent appears to do absolutely nothing? Precisely. Go on. Suppose I easily disarmed him with a deft blow to the temple. So now you've got the gun. Yes. Is it an untraceable Eastern European automatic equipped with a silencer and a chamber of plastic-tipped bullets? Probably. Go on. Well, thus, having been disarmed by an indiscernible deft blow to the temple, executed by a lethal exponent of certain moves, he would have spilled the beans about everything. Genuine material, genuine device... Genuine notebook, correct password, genuine map, correct secret hand signal, and correct funny walk, without my having to tie him up, torture him, or chop his legs off. I find that hard to believe. Why? Because a deft blow to the temple, executed by a lethal exponent of certain moves, who was in peak condition, would have killed him before he could spill the beans about anything. Suppose the deft blow was executed with extreme restraint, such that he was only rendered unconscious. How long was he unconscious? About ten minutes, I should think. Was he groggy when he spilled the beans? Of course he was. Was he still groggy when he demonstrated the funny walk, if there is one? Possibly. Well, how did he do it, if he did do it, and there is one? Whether he did do it, groggy or not, if there is one. And whether I demonstrated what he did, if he did do it, you might say it's not the correct funny walk, even if it is. Not if you demonstrate the incorrect funny walk deliberately. All right, but I'm not saying whether it's correct or incorrect, as a precaution. Ready? Yes. Shall I do it again? You've already made a fool of yourself once. Are you saying it was incorrect? No, I'm saying it wasn't funny. Well, surely that's a matter of opinion. In these circumstances, it's my opinion that matters. If you weren't an imposter, you'd know that correct funny walks are never supposed to be funny ha-ha, but funny peculiar. If there is one. <laughs> what was that? Telling me that you are unaware that a funny walk, if there is one, is always followed up by a lip blibble. A what? A lip blibble. If there is a lip blibble, and I'm not saying there's not... I noticed that you avoided saying whether it was correct or not. My equivocation was merely apparent. It always pays to be careful. I couldn't agree more. If my patience were not inexhaustible, your flippancy might have had grave repercussions. Are you saying you still have the gun? In what sense do you mean? How? In the sense of possession. In the sense of about my person? Either about your person or not. What would you say if I said I do still have the gun about my person? I'd say you were trying it on. Suppose I said I've decided to shoot you because I happen to have a short fuse. Would my death be instantaneous? Of course. I'm a professional. But what if you discovered that I didn't have the genuine material about my person? Well, then, I'd know that you were an imposter. Not necessarily. I might have hidden it elsewhere, as a precaution. Suppose your death wasn't instantaneous. Did you miss? It would be rash to provoke an armed, lethal exponent of certain moves with sarcasm. So, how long would I have? Long enough for me to extract a confession. After which death would follow without any hope of medical intervention or miraculous recovery. Of course. Where would I have been shot? Does it matter? Of course it matters. Why? If I knew I'd been fatally wounded, there would be no incentive to confess where I'd hidden it, even under torture. So, you have hidden it elsewhere? Not necessarily. Suppose it was merely a flesh wound. I would have thought a deft blow to the temple would be more professional. More professional, perhaps, but not necessarily more effective. Why not? Because you might have been too groggy to remember where you'd hidden it. If I had hidden it. You might have been too groggy to remember that you had hidden it, even under torture. Suppose 
that neither of us is an imposter and we are who we're supposed to be. Go on. Suppose there's no map, no secret hand signal, no funny walk, and no lip blibble. Go on. Suppose we start again, but this time with no more beating about the bush. With or without passwords? Without. On the basis of mutual trust. Agreed. Do you have it? Do I have what? Imposters was written by Jeff Best and directed by Emily Best. First was played by Greg Page and second was played by Simon Pasmo. It was produced by Robert Valentine and Jack Bowman. Music was composed by Timothy Thornton. Imposters is a play by Spool Productions. Welcome to Greenhorn Tales. Today's episode, moving, motorcycles, and marching bands. Where is Cam? We gotta move into our apartment today. Hope he's finished packing. Hello, Nicholas. Hi, Mr. Carson. Where's Cam? Is he finished packing? Didn't he tell you? He had to sell an item to make sure he had enough for the first and last month's rent. What item? It's about time you showed up. I didn't think you were coming. I wouldn't miss this for the world, man. You got the item? Yeah, I got it. You got the money? Not so fast, man. I want to see the quality of the merch first. If you know what I mean. (laughs) Fine. Here. Sweet ride. Man, it looks great. But there's got to be something wrong with it if you're getting rid of it. Nah, me and a buddy are moving out of our parents' places today and I need the money for our apartment. Oh yeah, moving day, eh? Big stuff. Two dudes about to strike out on their own for the first time. Big step. Yep. Big step. Nicholas, do me a favor, please. Sure, anything, sir. You know how Cameron isn't always the, uh, well, sometimes he's not so... I think I know what you mean. Don't worry, I'll look out for him. Thanks, Nicholas. And speaking of which, here he comes now. Hey, guys. Sold your bike, huh? Sorry about that. It's for the best. You all packed? Yeah, you? Sure, yeah. What's next? Dad hugs. Be safe out there, okay? Don't worry, sir. I'll make sure Nick here doesn't do anything foolish. Yeah, that's real encouraging. Ah, Well, Cam, here we are on the open road headed to our first apartment. Can you feel the excitement? Open roads are always more exciting on my hog, but yeah, I guess. Come on, it'll be great, buddy. Side note, though, why do they call them hogs? I don't get it. I don't know. Maybe it's the sound they make. I've never heard anyone describe motorcycles as oinking down the highway. Hogs don't oink. They sort of snort in a loud, tough, shrieking way. You know, shree! That sounds nothing like a motorcycle. Ah! Neither does that. No, hit the brakes! What? Marching band! Huh? Brakes! What happened? You weren't paying attention. We almost ran over our marching band. Good thing I told my dad I would be looking out for you. Yeah. What's with the band? I don't know. Let's ask the trombone player. He looks like he's just faking his notes anyway. Hey, dude! Yeah, man? Hey, Cam. Nick? Charlie? What's the deal with the marching band? Don't you know? It's for you guys. Us? Us? Yeah, man. You two moving out of your parents' basements is the biggest thing to happen to Bristol in ten years. Maybe even the biggest thing in the entire county in ten years. What about the time Pamela Bronson got her head stuck in her mailbox? That was over ten years ago. Listen, Charlie, this is really nice of you guys, but 
How long is this parade going on for? We have to get to the Riverview Apartments before 4 p.m. with our first and last month's rent, or Mr. Moretti will give the apartment to someone else. Wait, what about when the cheese factory caught on fire? Now that was less than 10 years ago, right? Sorry, Cam. That was 15 years ago. And yet the burnt cheese smell hasn't fully left the surrounding area. Don't worry, Nick. You'll be fine. It's only 2.30 now. You've got lots of time. Well, all right. The wig war! What? You know, when Johnson's Hardware and Ceiling Mart had that price battle over who sold wigs cheaper? That had to be only five years back. Sorry, Cam. Twelve years ago. All right, let's march. Ow! Man, it's nice to be thought of, but I didn't think the town cared that much about us. Whoa! Is that a torch-struggling monkey? And so... It is with great pleasure that I present Nick and Cam with the key to the town for their honesty, bravery, chivalry, and an unceasing willingness to help little old ladies across the street. This is all very flattering, sir. Speech! Speech! No, I I don't really... Oh, come now. Don't be bashful. Here, you take the microphone. Okay. Uh... Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Folks, I I really want to thank you for all your support. Although I'm not sure what's so brave or chivalrous about moving out of our parents' basements. Don't you know? Your parents donated their basements to storing the town of Bristol's marching band's instruments. Woo-hoo! Give it up, folks! Yeah! All right, that explains it. Thanks for the parade, the key to the town, and... The nice speeches, folks, but Cam and I better get going or we won't have an apartment to go to. Oh, don't be in such a rush. Stay a while. If we don't get the apartment, you won't be able to use the basements for band storage. Oh, well, well then, get going, you two. Yeah, I thought so. Hey, Nick, have we got time for a smoothie? What? No! We have less than 10 minutes to make it to the apartment. Ah, we've got time for this. You know Tim Buck's Coffee House has the best smoothies in town. And besides, I want to say goodbye to my cousin, too. She's working right now. Dude, we have to go! In a min. Stop here. Ah, uh, fine. <laughs> Hey, Jessica. Hey, guys. So, what'll it be? Give me a Fruitalicious Banana Explosion Extreme. Buying something? Whoa, miracle of miracles. No loitering for Wi-Fi today? Well, I'm celebrating our move for the purchase. Cam, we don't have time for this. Just say goodbye and let's go. Dude, you can't rush these things. Oh. Um, what's the rush, Nick? We have to get to our new apartment before 4 o'clock or Mr. Moretti might give it to someone else. He warned us. Ah, the big day, eh? Sit down and tell me about it. Oh. That's why we're here, Jessica. I came to say goodbye. That's nice of you, Cam, but we'll see each other again. You never know what could happen on our way there, Jessica. Or what else could happen. This better be the last stop, Cam. We've got less than two minutes left till four. I promise. Last stop. I just have to make sure I say goodbye to my boss. Oh, brother. Hey, boss! Well, well, if it isn't Nicholas and Cameron on the big day. Excited, boys? Yes, real excited. In fact, too excited to stay in chat. Hey, Cameron, before you go, can you help me with some boxes? We got an extra delivery of potato chips in today. I honestly don't know why they sent so much. A hardware store doesn't really need 18 crates of cheese curd-flavored potato chips. Mmm, my favorite. I'll let you take a box with you to your apartment, if you lend me a hand. Sold! Come on, Nick. Roll up your sleeves. This will only take a few minutes. A few minutes? (sighs) Are you upset because Mr. Johnson only gave us one box of cheese curd chips? I'm gonna share. Don't worry. It's not that. Oh, it's when we stopped so I could get a haircut, right? You don't like the mullet? Well, frankly, no, but that's not what's bothering me. It's the perm I got on top of it, isn't it? No, it's not. I knew it was too much, but Lorenzo insisted, and you know how he can be. Barbers, am I right? No, it's not that. The highlights? This has nothing to do with your hair, Cam. Um, 
inside voice, please? I'm sorry. You know I love seeing all these people and helping out where I can, but man, we're moving out on our own. We're supposed to be responsible for ourselves. But we're not even going to make it in time to secure our apartment. My dad always says that people come first. You gotta take the time for the people in your life or everything is meaningless. That's pretty profound. But we still need to balance that out with our commitments or we're not men of our word. True. Cheese curd chip? No thanks. Well, I guess we're too late to get the apartment now anyway. Some big day, huh? We may still get the apartment. Just because it's past four doesn't mean someone else took it yet. You think? You could always ask Mr. Moretti. He's standing right outside your door. Ah! I didn't think we were that close. Mr. Moretti, sir. We're really sorry about being so late. We headed out early, yes, but... Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Excuses, excuses. I've heard them all before. But don't waste my time, boys. We're really sorry. If the apartment is still vacant, we'd still really like to rent it. This is a matter of principle. I cannot just... Hey, there. That those are cheese or curd chips? In the cheese. Want some? Yes, please. Here, have a whole bag. Mmm, just like my mama used to make. So good. Uh, Mr. Moretti, now, about the apartment. As I said, it's a principal of the thing. And any clientele with a taste as good as yours, she is a clientele worthy of my apartments. Welcome to your new home, gentlemen. <laughs> Close, man. I never thought I'd say this, but if it wasn't for your cheese curd chips, we wouldn't be here right now. I told you. People come first. And cheese curds are the currency of the future. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it worked out in the long run. Ho-ho, our first official knock on our official apartment door. Would you like to do the honors? Sure. Hey, boys. Cameron, you forgot your wallet. Whoa, Dad. You traveled all this way to bring that to me? (laughs) I guess that world's best dad mug I got you for Christmas was right. Uh, Cameron, the apartment's literally three blocks from our house. Oh yeah, (laughs) I forgot. Thanks for listening to the series pilot of Greenhorn Tales. Moving, motorcycles, and marching bands was written by Christopher Green. Our cast included Christopher Green as Cameron, J.D. Sutter as Nicholas, and guest starring Dwayne Riffenberg as the mayor. For the full credits, visit GreenhornTales.com. I'm Stephanie Cover, and we'll see you next time. Porchlight Family Media. Your source for family-centered content. PorchlightFamilyMedia.com. Hey there, I'm J.D. Sutter, executive producer and director of Greenhorn Tales, and the voice of Nicholas Vincent. In a moment, I just want to share a little bit about what's ahead for season one of the show, but first, I just want to say thank you for listening to this pilot episode. I really appreciate you taking the time, and I really hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, would you do me a favor and just share it with a friend? Telling someone else about Greenhorn Tales is the best way for us to grow the show. And secondly, if you'd like to help us with the production costs of Season 1, which is going to be 10 episodes, stop by greenhorntails.com slash donate and drop us a buck or two. We're going to make Season 1 regardless, but you can help speed up the production time by helping us out a little bit. Again, that address is greenhorntails.com slash donate to share a donation of any amount. All right, now about Season 1. As I mentioned just a moment ago, it will be 10 episodes, and since the show revolves around Cam and Nick, you're going to hear from them in every episode. Now, Cam's boss, Mr. Johnson, and his cousin Jessica will be recurring characters that will show up from time to time, as will Mr. Moretti, the landlord. Here are uh, three titles from upcoming episodes, just to give you a little sneak peek at what's coming up. Campouts and Strikeouts. Planes and Pony Rides, and finally, Fiddles and Flapjacks. Now, I'm not going to tell you which episodes those are going to be and when they're going to be coming in this season, but that's just a few of them. Now, over the course of the ten episodes, the guys are going to 
participate in a pie contest. At some point, Cam will decide they need a pet, and Nick will take a sudden interest in medieval armor. Through it all, Frank Johnson will be trying to steer them in the right direction, and all the while, Mr. Moretti will be holding his hand out for the rent money. We really hope you will stick around for all the laughs. And finally, I just want to say a quick shout-out to my absolutely amazing team. Christopher Green, thanks for believing in this crazy idea and helping me flesh it out and working on this project with me since the very beginning. To Heidi, Connor, Michael, Stephanie... Austin, and all the actors, I want to say a massive thank you for all you've done to get us to this point. We absolutely could not have done this without you. So thank you. And thanks again to you for listening. We're going to chat again soon in Season 1. It's going to be a blast. Stay with us. Buongiorno, I am Flaudio, and I am very interested in what makes audio drama work. I want to share with you my recipe for a perfect evening, an evening for two lovers, lovers of audio drama. When I plan an audio drama, I want to make sure that everything is perfect for us. The soundscape is the most important thing to set the mood for the night. When I lay in a special ambiance or sound effect, it is very important because it can express what I feel so perfectly. A sound effect can speak for the story when words just cannot capture the love I feel. Love I feel for you. When it is dark, I turn on the sound effects, I turn up the soundscape, and the voices can then dance in a perfect state of bliss, where there is no world except the one we make with our love. No time except what is needed for our story to play out. A story that we will make come true. This audio drama public service announcement was brought to you by the Amigos. These are your three stories. Where is she, Greg? Get out of here! Perhaps this wasn't going to be an ordinary ghost investigation. What the hell are you? I'm a Sasquatch. Oh, God. It sounded like something was hovering. Why are you still walking the halls of this place? If I tell guys up front that I am a giant hairy Sasquatch, then nobody is ever going to give me a chance. My room then, filled with a very bright light. Felton, are you in love with me? Wait! Don't go! Get out! And that's this week's show. And in place of our normal request for feedback, David and I would like to make a monster of an announcement. Yeah, I knew there wasn't a real monster. (laughs) Well, we're all hoping. (laughs) You see, for the last couple of months, behind the scenes, a small cadre of ours have been working on a new venture. Yes, for years, we've been providing the Sonic Society as an opportunity to introduce you, the listener, to the world of modern audio drama. And it's been our pleasure to discover literally hundreds of audio drama companies and now thousands of shows and we think we can do better better for you and better for the whole audio drama community thus we built the Mutual Audio Network. Now, the Mutual Network will be grabbing a whole bunch of audio drama feeds based on themes. Mirthful Mondays will be comedy shows. Thriller Thursdays, well, that pretty much explains itself. And if you're concerned that you need to add something or you'll lose the Sonic Society, don't panic. Nothing will change except you'll get a whole lot more content than before. 
and it all begins March 1st. We'll talk more about this whole thing through the month of February. And speaking of the month of February, are you ready for Nadzrim? Yes. Are you, Jack? Are you? <laughs> I'm hoping. You're adding more <laughs> to your list of things to do. I know. Because... <laughs> <laughs> because Nadzrim is ready for you on the 1st of February. What stories will you be writing? What scripts will you create? Go to the Sonic Society website to check out details on Nadzrim 2019. And from all of us here at the Sonic Society, thanks so much for your listening these many years, and we'll see you the same bat time, same bat channel next week. I'm Jack Ward. And I'm David Alt. Good night. Night all. The Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Nine degrees in my room here right now. What? The door shut. So, <gasps> so, <laughs> oh, so I am no. shivering a little. <laughs> Must be absolutely frozen. Pretty much. So. Wow. Okay, well, let's get through this then. <laughs> the following message is for podcasters only. If you are a listener and not a podcaster, you are permitted to cover your ears and say la 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 for the next 30 seconds or so. Okay. Podcasters, la, 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 if you create la, la, audio drama and or comedy, you are invited to join the brand new Mutual Audio Network. Not only will your productions be showcased in a brand new Netflix-ish type of distribution, but you'll also share in resources from music to sound effects to voices la, 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 to people saying la 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 la. For details, visit MutualAudioNetwork.com or inquire at MutualAudio at gmail.com. You can stop la-la-ing now. I can't hear you. Got my ears covered. La-la!